We've sure. talked about the possible downturn from the economy overall from coronavirus, specifically with oil. What are you looking at? And particularly, we talked about V versus U versus L. What are you looking at? Well, we're already looking at a very big decline that in February, Chinese uh, oil demand is more than 20 percent lower than it was a year ago. And world oil demand is certainly going to be much lower than had been anticipated. We think it's going to be lower than uh, the growth than other people think. And I think it also continues in turn into other commodities. Our material pri price index shows that uh, commodity prices uh, last week went down 6 percent. So all of this is a result of China. Just when you thought the trade deal's done, things are recovered, we're not going to decouple, well, we now see China slowing down and a de facto decoupling with airlines cutting their air service to China. Uh, OK, so that's on the demand side. What about supply? Is OPEC Plus going to weigh in and cut more? Well, they've been going back and forth, and I think it in particular has to do with whether the Russians, the most important part of the plus is Russia and whether they want to get on board, and they've been hanging back. Partly, I think, because the Russians say if you cut uh, supplies, uh, who's, it's only going to benefit the U.S., and we don't want to give more market share to the U.S. But I think the signs are that they're going to edge towards that and try and put some kind of floor under, under the price in this very uncertain situation. Uh, hi, Dan. It's Steve. But the oil market itself, I think, uh, relative to all those uh, changes in demand that you talked about, and also on the supply side, I think the uh, neutral zone right in, uh, between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia is coming back online. I'm actually kind of surprised oil hasn't gone down more. It's sort of hung in there around this $50 level, even given everything you've said. Well, there's been one other factor that's been out there. You mentioned neutral zone and other su supplies. Libya. Libya is almost completely shut down, and Libya has really become a war between not only between the two sides in that internal battle, but Turkey on one side uh, with Qatar and uh, Saudis, UAE, and uh, Egypt on the other side. And that's shut down, and that's removed almost a million barrels a day from the market. If Libya was in the market, we would certainly, as you're suggesting, see oil prices lower than they are today. Dan, is, is uh, growth of shale trickling off here in the United States as a practical matter. I know they're having some problems with the investments. Some bills are getting due. Right. Well, I, I think what's happened there is the investors have said, show me the money. We want returns. And that means that it's no longer growth at any cost. It's growth at what cost. So we think we're not going to see this one and a half, two million barrel a day extraordinary growth that we've seen for several years. This year, we would have expected about 400,000 barrels a day. Maybe with lower prices, it'll be lower than that, and basically a flattening out. The U.S. still stays the world's largest oil producer, but not with that kind of upward growth uh, that had been such a dynamic in the marketplace. So, Dan, the new BP CEO has taken a fairly aggressive position now on carbon. Is this the first of many in the oil industry? Well, I think, first of all, it is a bold step uh, in a very changing energy future. Uh, you'd had the other European majors, Shell and the smaller Spanish one, Repsol, doing it, but nobody has done it in the form, in this kind of comprehensive form. And it reflects, I think, uh, the way the world has changed. Uh, the force of the regulators, particularly the Bank of England, the attitude uh, of investors, and what governments are doing. Uh, the uh, new president of the EU has said climate is the number one political issue facing Europe, and countries and uh, EU are aiming at uh, net zero carbon. And so what uh, Bernard Looney has really said at BP is, we're going to get on board and we're going to do that. And it's going to take a lot of investment and a lot of technology to get there. Dan, uh, he also said that the price of oil could go as far down as $40, maybe, in his scenarios that he came up with. Uh, and then when we look at the actual numbers that BP is spending on renewable energy or things related to renewable energy versus their classic oil and gas business, it's a tiny fraction at about 500, 600 million versus 14 uh, billion. So how do you sort of put that well, together? I think, so, Afsani, I think, first of all, just to keep oil production where it is, you're going to have to add 40 uh, billion barrels uh, over the next 25 years or so. And people are not going to throw away their automobiles right away. I mean, we have 300 million cars in the United States. So that supply is really going to be necessary. I think the issue people have, and you probably have as an investor, there aren't a huge number of things to invest in in the renewable sector at this point. Most of the solar panels are made in China. 
Uh, obviously, wind is the other big thing. But people are looking at, at what else can you do? You've got to do carbon capture. Maybe you capture carbon from the air. Uh, maybe plants have a much more important role. So it's, it's not like you can just uh, put, you know, windmills everywhere. And by the way, most cars don't operate on electricity. You know, we have uh, uh, 1.4 billion cars in the world that operate on gasoline, exactly. and they're not going to go away overnight. Well, Dan, to your point, uh, coincidentally, we met yesterday uh, with an investment firm that does upstream oil and gas, or was doing it anyway. <laughs> and uh, that we got to this question of renewables, and they're trying to do renewables. But there are two problems, uh, and just uh, what you said. One, there's not that much to do. You can't invest billions of dollars profitably. And secondly, we've looked ourselves at quite a number of renewable ideas over the last few years. We have yet to find one where the economics pencil out to what we would expect to get from another investment. You can do it for social reasons, but we haven't found one yet to do for financial reasons. But putting all that aside, I think the question uh, I'd like to ask you is, what it, the, when you boil it all down then, what do you see as the long-term outlook for oil prices? If oil goes down to $40, you're going to have drigs laid down all over the Permian Basin, which will shut supply down, put some uh, upward pressure on prices. On the other hand, you do have this en these enormous forces trying to curb demand. Whether they'll be successful or not, we'll see. So when you guys put it all together, what do you think? Well, I th at this point, our, our base case still is we see oil demand rising till the kind of mid-2030s because the world adds 2 billion people, because incomes go up, and then you get a flattening out of that. Uh, it has to come with a much more uh, carbon capture to get there. But the point that you make is that you really, technology is going to be the really big thing. We, we did a study with Ernie Moniz, the former energy secretary for Bill Gates's group, on what are the breakthrough areas that you need. And there, there are a number of them where you need big breakthroughs, whether it's in storage, whether it's in carbon capture. And those are going to have to be uh, part of the armory to uh, really uh, address the kind of climate goals. So Europe has these very aggressive goals, but they don't really know how they're going to get there, and they don't yet know how they're going to pay for it. So, Dan, if you're the CEO of BP or of Shell or of Exxon, uh, do you at some point become essentially a cash cow? Uh, in, in this sense, you can say I'm going to move into renewables. Let's assume at some point there are things to invest in your renewables. Why are you going to be better at that than somebody else, a tech company or somebody else? Why does what you know as an oil and gas producer translate over into windmills, well, it, into solar, well, things like that? Well, it does, it does in terms of scale. For instance, uh, if you're going to do offshore wind, if you have scales in terms of doing offshore, offshore oil, you have some to really bring to the party. And I think we'll see uh, the oil majors uh, move into offshore wind in a more significant way. But that's really a question that almost goes back to Steve. If, if you're investing, Steve, in renewables or Afsani, do you want to invest in somebody who's a specialist in that, or do you want to invest in a general company that's, that's doing well, that? Look, the, short, the short answer is there really aren't very many people who know about renewables. It's a relatively new thing. And uh, our view would be that someone who's a good investor, who knows the energy space, and that maybe has some experience with offshore or this or that, as qualified as anybody if they can uh, to figure it out. But uh, as I said, we've yet to see a project right. that meets and our return I standards. Think, yeah, I think the other thing that I see among the majors is there's a focus on technological innovation, on new technologies, on venture capital, going to what you're saying, Steve, that really never seen at this level of intensity to say you have to go down a number of paths if you want to be a player in the future. You see them in, they're in fast charging uh, of vehicles, for instance, battery research. Uh, saying we want to be a player in what's going to be the future, even if the future is not yet very clear. Dan, as uh, you know better than anybody else, Shell, BP, and all the large majors used to have large renewable groups within the oil companies in the 80s. And in fact, they shut them down later in the 90s. And of course, a lot of venture money was lost around 2008. But at the same time as that has been going on, there, there has been people who've been experienced in this area. And if, especially you go into emerging markets, pretty much outside of China, a lot of the new energy capacity that is getting built out is um, the 
energy based on renewable sources. So if you go to uh, to whether it's India, whether it is uh, whether it is Bangladesh, whether it is Pakistan and uh, or well, Bolivia well, or Colombia. Uh, let me let me disagree a, a little bit. I think that's true. But if you go to India, we work closely with the with India. Right. And they're re doing renewables. They're also very committed to really increasing natural gas use exactly. in their economy to clean up their air. And it's interesting, China, ha half the new capacity in wind and solar every year goes into China. But by the way, China is also building three new coal fired plants a month. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of mixed picture. That's why I think right. the notion of a transition really describes something that's going to unfold over a couple of decades.